Hi, welcome to Minnesota's Debate 98. I'm Ken Stone with KTCA's Newsnight Minnesota. Uh, with me tonight are Pat Miles from CARE 11 News, Jeff Passolt from Minnesota 9 News, and Colleen Needles from Channel 5 Eyewitness News. And all you channel surfers out there, there's nothing wrong with your television set. Twin Cities television stations are tonight coming together to share a debate between the major party candidates for governor. We want all Minnesotans to have the chance to hear what the candidates have to say about the issues important to you. And that's why we also have a live audience at the Mall of America ready to ask their own questions of the candidates. Okay, now if you have cable, there's always that uh, rerun of chips on TNT, but uh, otherwise grab some popcorn. Uh, settle back, this should be a good hour. Uh, we're ready to get started with our first round of questions, uh, but first we're going to introduce the candidates, not that they necessarily need it, but here they are, alphabetical order. Norm Coleman, a Republican, currently serving his second term as mayor of St. Paul. Hubert Humphrey III, a Democrat, finishing his fourth term as the state's attorney general. And Jesse Ventura, a Reform Party member and former mayor of Brooklyn Park. Now, uh, each of our panelists will ask questions of the candidates uh, with options to follow up and move on. There's no stopwatches here. We're going to try to keep this loose and informal, and we're going to start with Colleen Needles. All right, thanks, Ken. Gentlemen, Northwest Airlines dominates the airline business in this state, and I think that was very evident during the strike when it was difficult to get in and out of this state. A recent study just showed that we pay businesses and consumers here 45% more for airfare in the state than in other states. And uh, now they are proposing a merger with Continental, and the Justice Department is taking issue with that, saying it's going to hurt competition. What role? We have to live with the airline. What role do you think the state, Norm, let's start with you, the state should uh, play in trying to increase competition or give consumers a better deal in this yeah. state? Colleen, there's really a balance uh, that you need here. First of all, competition drives quality, and then competition will drive down costs. So we have to play a more active and aggressive role in trying to generate and ensure some measure of competition at our airport. And we've seen that with, with the, uh, uh, the issue over prices. Now, on the other hand, the other piece of balance is Northwest Airlines is, I think, the largest employer in the state of Minnesota. So you want to keep the jobs here. You want to keep the job, but we have to be much, much more aggressive than we have been in the past. I've challenged the Attorney General on that. When, when other AGs came together and went to court to, to push the issue of, of, of competition, we didn't join in in that measure. I think we need to be more aggressive than we've been, but we don't want to blow away Northwest Airlines. Keep them here, grow the jobs, and bring more competition into our airport. Let's hear from the Attorney General on that. Well, I think that uh, what Northwest Airlines needs is a healthy dose of competition. And uh, frankly, I think the Department of Justice is saying the same thing in its uh, recent litigation that it started. But the key to this is not to jump into a lawsuit at the state level. It's making sure that we have the kind of competition and the framework of federal laws that will allow for that openness of competition so that consumers actually have a choice. Colleen, you raise a very good point. When, when that airline shut down, we couldn't do anything. So we need to make sure that we're balancing not only the uh, competition side, but the high quality of workers that are there, the people that are employed. This is an important employer in our uh, state and an industry, and very important, of course, as a hub if we're going to continue to have access to the global uh, markets and the world itself. But on the other hand, we need to have that kind of framework of choice. And I think it's very important that we see that kind of competition take place. Well, I know a lot about Northwest Airlines. I have, uh, what, I think 1.2 million frequent flyer miles. So I've uh, frequented Northwest Airlines quite often throughout my career. But yes, I agree. You know, competition drives the prices down. We need to open up the airport. We need to allow more gates for uh, uh, competitive airlines because we don't want to get frozen again. If something happens to Northwest Airlines, we can't allow our city and our industry here in Minnesota to, to face being backed and cornered into a corner like that. And I agree, too, that uh, certainly Northwest is a huge employer. We want to ensure that their success continues here in the state of Minnesota. But we're just one of three hubs of Northwest. They also have Memphis in Detroit and uh, as far as the uh, the merger well that's in litigation that's the court system and that's ju the judicial end of government and so that's where it'll be handled gentlemen the state bailed out Northwest Airlines at one time what about incentives are you in favor of incentives to get other airlines to come in that's been the big gripe that airlines have had who've tried to come into this market yeah. that people simply weren't flying them or it just was too difficult for them to gain a toehold here now, I think you've got to look at first of all the Metropolitan Airport Commission we need to make sure that it's opening up gates to other 
airlines so that we have that opportunity. Jeff, you raised the question about uh, on another debate uh, about the, the business of the contracts and the agreements that were made. Uh, my understanding from what I've been able to check on is that in fact they are on, uh, uh, Northwest is meeting its obligations now under those contracts to expand the jobs and uh, the opportunities for expanded business. But I think it's not only what the company itself can do and the private sector, it's also what state government through the metropolitan airports can do to see that we have that access as consumers to a wider variety of uh, airlines. The issue of incentives uh, is such that if the incentives don't ensure that the competition can continue, then the incentives are really worthless. In other words, what you've got to do is you've got to make sure that other airlines have a competitive opportunity so that they can, they can exist. It's not enough to say, we'll give you some bucks to get you in here if, in fact, you can't make it in the marketplace. And, and uh, you do work through the Metropolitan Airport Commission, but other companies, other companies have to make, the private sector has to make some decisions about their ability to operate in this market. So we can play a role, but in the end, if you put some bucks on the table, if you can't compete and sustain the competition, then those dollars get wasted. Okay, let's head out near the airport. We're going to go to the Mall of America where we have some citizens. we got a question. Hi, my name is Dan Geary from South Minneapolis, and um, as a teacher, I couldn't agree more that we need more parental involvement in education. I would like some real-world concrete examples on how you plan to uh, involve parents in education. Okay, Jesse Ventura. Well, I plan to involve parents by going back to the neighborhood schools again, like it was when I went to public school at Minneapolis Roosevelt High School, Sanford Junior High, and Cooper Grade School. You go back to neighborhood schools, then you can get parental involvement, you have strong PTAs, and you have the, the school become the focal point of that neighborhood, and it tumbles on down dealing with crime, it deals with everything. It creates an identity for the neighborhood. We need to get back to local schools like that. We also need to lower those class sizes, and the money's been appropriated. But our legislature seems to not, uh, they write laws that uh, if the money gets to the local districts, but there's loopholes, it's being allowed to be spent on other things. We need to tighten that up and get back to that 17 to 1 ratio, which we already have a law that says that's supposed to happen right now. So that's what Jesse Ventura will do. Jesse Ventura sends his kids to public schools. So Jesse Ventura believes in the public school system. You know, parents and students, their children, need to be involved not only K through 12, but frankly, we need to have more involvement even at the very earliest stages. And that is where parents need to have much more discretion and, uh, and help from uh, people and, and from the uh, state government. And that is where child care comes into account. That's why in our budget, Roger Moe's and my budget, we propose a significant uh, tax cut that will help uh, parents have that kind of involvement at the early stages of their life and we invest at the very early stages as well. But uh, it is not only community schools that we have to be involved with. I, I was involved with our PTA out in the Robbinsdale School District along with my wife all through the time that our children were uh, going to uh, school there. But in addition, you've got to make sure that you have it for charter schools and for the alternative learning centers. Those are areas where parents need to be be a key part. That's where most of the learning takes place. It's not in the schoolroom. It's frankly in the family and the home. Let, let me give you some specifics because that's what you really asked for. Uh, first, you're right. Parents being involved in kids' education is, is probably one of the most significant things we can do to make sure our kids are, are better and smarter and, and are, are better educated. Site-based management. Get parents and teachers involved at the local level making decisions about spending decisions. Not the bureaucrats in St. Paul. The whole issue of profiling, I want to give you, the teachers and parents, I want you to be involved in telling us, the state, how we meet the high standards and accountability that we're demanding. We want high standards. We want accountability. But I want to take the mandates off your shoulder. I want to, have, I want to stop having the bureaucrats tell you, here's exactly what you have to teach. I will have parents, I'll give you the opportunity. I'm not gonna, I'll give you the opportunity. Parents, teachers working together to decide how we're going to meet the high standards. And finally, what we need is community schools. We've done that in St. Paul with Achievement Plus. We've got places in the school should be a center for the community. Jesse's right, neighborhood schools, but beyond that. So if we can give parents an opportunity to be involved, community schools, if we can really give them the opportunity to work with you on curriculum so that we can meet the high standards, and then you do site-based management, you'll have real parental involvement, you'll have better educated kids, and we're going to have a better Minnesota. I'd like to ask a follow-up on the community schools. Are you comfortable when a school district goes to community schools and then what happens is that schools get resegregated? 
Uh, I don't have a problem with it at all because to me the ultimate, I think, and I stated this right in the heart of North Minneapolis in front of a huge African American and they applauded and cheered so they don't have a problem and I'd like to add that I chose May Shunk as my lieutenant governor. Here's a woman that can't always go out and campaign. Why? She's teaching children every day. You want to find out the problems about school? Ask a teacher. They know what's happening out there. Skip Humphrey, what Ken, about resegregation? You raise a very good point. It's fine if you just have those community schools, but you need to make sure you have all of the other options available in every part of our state, in every school district of our state. If we're going to desegregate on the basis of community schools and the other kinds of choices, we need to make sure that the resources are there, the investment is made. And it's fine to make all of these statements about how we're going to have new standards and all the rest, but frankly, you got to be able to put the money, the resources, where you're saying your message. And the fact is that Roger Moe and I are the only ones that make substantial investments that allow us to actually have those standards in place. That's real important. Force busing has been a terrible failure. We should, we should get rid of it. You know, talk, to the, talk to the moms of the kids in Cedar County in Minneapolis uh, about, about what you can do with a neighborhood school. Uh, we should be able to have strong neighborhood schools, a, a firm commitment, financial commitment, absolutely, but we should get rid of forced busing. It has been a failure. It's hurting kids. It's not helping kids. Okay, we're now going to go to what we call a speed question. That means a one-word answer. All right, gentlemen? And Pat Miles gets to ask it. I just need a one-word answer, uh, gentlemen, and it's not a yes or no question, but if you were not a candidate in this election, um, Jesse, who would you vote for? Who would I vote for if That's I were not a candidate in this election? Um, that's a tough question. Pat. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, that's a very hard question, and, and uh, uh, it's just one word answer, Jesse. <laughs> Pardon me. <laughs> just one name answer. Just one name answer. Who would I vote for if I were not a candidate? Either the guy to the left or the guy to the right, or there's some minor party. Yeah. These are the yeah. candidates, Jesse. These are the candidates. Yeah. There are minor party candidates, of course. Yeah. Uh, All those Democrats are going to spend us to death. Come on. You know, <laughs> now, now, wait a moment. I thought we had one <laughs> word <laughs> answers. <laughs> Kim Pantel. All right. <laughs> you asked me next. Kim. Norm Coleman. Norm. Oh, I, I, I'd write in Norm Coleman. <laughs> That's not an answer. <laughs> That's not an answer. Uh, I think I'd, I'd, I'd write in say, with great respect for the work Skip's done as Attorney General and great respect for all the issues that Jesse's raised. I, I'd write in somebody not at not not at this table. I think I think I'd write in Tim Puente. <laughs> All right, there you go. Let's go to a regular question now. Jeff Passel. Okay, I want to get back to uh, incentives just a little bit, not to beat on the same thing uh, all night long, but uh, recently Nordic Track CML uh, announced that they're having uh, very difficult problems. Thousands of people laid off, tens of thousands of uh, square footage of warehouse space in the Chaska Chanhassen area will be empty now. Uh, there has been talk about incentives that help out Minnesota businesses, and we're talking about a business here that's a prototype in its market that's known around the world. And so, therefore, you would think that the state takes great pride in the fact that it's being produced here and developed here. Should the state step in and help out corporations like this? Could the state have stepped in and helped out in this case? And uh, I believe we are starting with Norm. You know, the best way to help business, Jeff, is to cut taxes. Cut regulation. We kill, we kill, we drive. Make sure, by the way, we, we don't do what the Attorney General has considered, roll back workers' comp reform. You roll back that and you then increase the cost of doing business. So the best way to help business is, is, is to make sure that we cut taxes, we cut regulation, we make sure that we have quality folks available. One of the single biggest issues today are qualified workers, quality education, use a technical college to train people for the specific jobs that are out there. But that's the way you do it. You do it by shaping. I cannot make any business more competitive. I can't sell their product, but I can affect the environment. Cut taxes. That's what I've. That's what I. Same point. I got eight thousand more jobs. L cutting let me taxes. Ask, let me ask a quick follow-up. But the question is, is that when a business is foundering, mm -hmm. where do you draw the line? This is a company that seemed to have it all, and in a few short years started to slip. 
some of the signs so, were there. So, so where do you draw Should the line? Should the state step in? Where do you draw the line on, yes, well, the, we will provide you know, some the help? The marketplace is going to have its ups and downs, and businesses are going to succeed, and some are not going to be able to succeed. But sure, you need to have tax cuts. That's why I've got a billion dollars of permanent income tax cuts, $340 million worth of property tax which cuts, which are very important uh, to businesses. But most important, if you ask any CEO, is to make absolutely certain that the state is investing in good public education so that we have the best talented, best trained, best educated workforce. That is what the demand is, combined with transportation so that people can get to the work, combined with affordable housing so that they can live closer to the jobs. That is where the role of the state of Minnesota becomes. Those are the incentives, the, the, the basic fabric and baselines that will help our businesses grow. Government is not there to ensure that every business succeeds. Government can't do that. If a business succeeds or fails out in the free marketplace, you can't go looking to government to bail them all out. Because then how do you pick and choose? Which business gets help, which doesn't? You know, you're creating a, a, a dilemma there beyond belief. Certainly we need to create an environment, again, cut taxes, cut regulations, and make it so that businesses can succeed here in the state of Minnesota. But beyond that, that's private enterprise. There's a separation between private enterprise and government. And I don't believe that government can be getting involved in ensuring that a, a business succeeds. Again, which one do you pick then? Well, you know, what business, happens when you provide the incentives well, and you suggest that Northwest is on track now, but in essence, they're two years behind their part of the agreement? <laughs> My understanding, and I've checked on this, Jeff, is that indeed they are meeting all of their obligations at this time. But let me just suggest there is a distinction between what NordaTrack is going through, and I hope that they're able to turn that around. I hope they can, when they go, sometimes when you go into bankruptcy, if it's reorganization, you can turn it around, you give that kind of protection for a while from creditors, and you can come back even stronger. We've seen that, and that's part of what the banks or bankruptcy laws are all about. But there is a distinction between that kind of a company and when we're talking about Northwest, which is one of the fundamental key elements for all other businesses. The transportation area is a, a very key element for our access to all of the other markets. So that's where I think that perhaps you can draw a little bit of a line when there is such a fundamental importance to so many other businesses and part of our society. And that's why the state of Minnesota on a bipartisan basis got involved uh, with Northwest when they were in trouble because it affected so many others. Okay, I'm still going to stop it right here. Let's go back out to the Mall of America. We have another question from my another name citizen. My Sue Stout, and I'm from Burnsville, Minnesota. And my parents are elderly. My father takes a number of medications. He finds that the cost of medications makes it very difficult for him to uh, uh, continue to pay those costs. He uh, is very concerned about the fact that he's paying hundreds of dollars for medications. I would like to know what the gubernatorial candidates will do to help decrease the cost of prescription drugs for seniors. Who wants to take it? I'll, I'll jump on it quickly. Uh, I find it very interesting. You know, you never hear the professional politician, the career politician, complaining about his medical situation and his HMO or his retirement. Notice that, first of all. They don't have a problem because they can pick and choose what they want and how they vote it. Uh, I think that maybe, uh, you know, we've, we've got an excess of tobacco money that, uh, that has been collected now via, via settlement, uh, uh, and taxes are now collected via the court system, which is a novel new idea. But that money is coming in, and I think that might be a proper place to spend some of it uh, to ensure that, uh, that the elderly are not missing meals trying to pay per, for prescription drugs. And then, of course, federally, we need to work on them getting Medicare and Medicaid up better. Norm Coleman? It's certainly the issue of health care for elderly in particular, since they consume the most health care and really are most impacted by it, is, is a critical issue. Uh, start, by the way, with cutting the cost of health care. And, and my tax cut, $3.1 billion tax cut over four years, sustainable, real, across the board. But we do get rid of the sick tax. We get rid of the tax that you pay when you go to a doctor, you go to a clinic. And we use some of the tobacco money for doing that. You should do that. Secondly, the, the key to bringing down cost is, is in uh, larger bu buying power. And what we need to do is we need to give some, present some opportunities for seniors to be able to come together. By the way, not necessarily a government program. Government doesn't have to do this. But create a larger, an opportunity for seniors to create larger buying pool 
so that they then can cut down the cost of prescription drugs. So let us work with the private side. Let us create that kind of bargaining pool that will then cut the cost. But again, it doesn't have to be a government program, but we can work with seniors to make sure we accomplish that. Well, first of all, you know, this I find interesting because it's not just cutting costs. It's being fair. The fact is that senior citizens are on Medicare, and we all pay the same Medicare dollars as we're working. But if you live in Minnesota, you get shortchanged. Why? Because we have lower average costs. If you live in Florida or you live in Texas or Louisiana, you get all of your coverage. It's all of those drugs are covered. But you come up to Minnesota, rather than getting a pat on the back by the federal government, you get beat up and you have to pay your co-pays. And that is a terrible situation where it's a choice between do I buy the groceries today or do I pay for my prescription drugs so that I can continue to have decent health. So number one, as governor, I'm going to go down to Washington and I'm going to pound on those desks and I'm going to take on this federal government and we are going to get that Medicare formula straightened out. But there are some things that we can do in the state. Once again, uh, I'm the only one that's made a detailed proposal and provided the resources for it in a budget. And that is, number one, for those at the lowest uh, level of, uh, of those uh, of, of uh, senior citizens, we can cut down those costs up to 70% so that uh, what I proposed is an initiative that will provide for no more than $200 per year for those uh, that are uh, near or just above the poverty line. And for every senior citizen that has a, uh, a, a Medicare card, uh, I'm going to be working with pharmacies and we are going to pull a pool together and we will have a lower cost area. That will complement what the state is already doing with regard to their own formularies. Okay, okay, I, I have to jump in on this because Skip ran for the U.S. Senate 10 years ago. Play back the tape. And 10 years ago he said the same thing that he was going to be pounding on the table to make sure that we equalize those costs, those Medicare costs, because we are, we're losing. We're losing. You've been Attorney General for 10 years during that period. And in that 10 year period, nothing's been done. Progress is not. So we're here again now, and the same promise is being made. But go back, play back the tape. Ten years ago, he said this is a terrible situation. Senior, seniors in Minnesota being overcharged. I'm going to pound away at it. Back. Can you believe? And it hasn't changed. He's right. The problem is real. We do need a change. Problem but but can you deliver? Ten years it? ago, Norm was a Democrat. And working in my office. <laughs> I wish you would have sent me to Washington to work on that one. Oh, yeah, right. I would have got it done. Right. All right, all right, all right. Time for another yeah. speed question. Yeah. Time for another speed question. One word answers. Jeff gets to ask this one. Okay, what about uh, reducing the size of government? Uh, do you support the change to a unicameral legislature? I'll jump in. Absolutely. First absolutely ahead of him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we ought to look at it. All right, very good. Pat, you have the next question. Um, people say that politicians today really do not understand the lives of ordinary people out there. Uh, in light of that, and as we approach the Thanksgiving holiday, yeah. and I'll start with you, Skip, could you tell us what you think the current non-special price per pound of a frozen turkey is at Twin <laughs> Cities supermarkets? <laughs> you know, I got to tell you, I don't know. I, I do not know. I, I don't buy the turkeys in my family. <laughs> but I'll guarantee you, we're going to cook a really good, yeah. good one. We usually bring our families together, and uh, this year is going to be very special because usually we did it with my mother and Max, and she's no longer with us. And so uh, all of us join together. Uh, I think it is uh, maybe our turn to actually cook the turkey. We rotate it around our family. That's a real important. Well, you'll have to find out uh, how much I'm it costs. I'm going to have to find out what that uh, cost turkey is. Unfortunately, this year I'm off the hook. I went down to uh, Worthington to Turkey Days, and I was the Grand Marshal down there for the turkey race, and they presented me with a free certificate <laughs> to, get my, to get my own turkey for going down there. But uh, what would I guess per pound? She's, uh, I don't know, the, you know that, that, that's my wife's territory there, I've got to be honest. That's your constituents territory. <laughs> in fact, I actually, I don't think that's just a politician's issue. I make it better if my dad was sitting in this chair. He couldn't tell you that. Now, he'd tell you how to carve it. He'll do that. He couldn't tell you how to cook it. Uh, and I can't tell you. I don't, I don't, I don't shop for the turkey. I, on, now and again, I get out there and I buy some milk. And if there's some cereal that's needed in the morning, the price of that's going up. But, I do, but you don't, that's not just a politician's issue. I think it's about who's working, who has time, who's available. When you got mom and dad both working, it's really a chump. But my wife is much better. I'm sure she could tell you to the, to the dime in that one. Could so I follow up by asking you if you think it's important for candidates to be in touch with this kind of issue? Well, I, think, I think they are, but I don't think that's a fair measure. 
I don't think that's the main. Absolutely, you have to be in town. I'm a dad. We're dads. We're dads here. We're dads. Our kids go to school. You know, we have, we have, we have moms. I, my mom and dad, thank God, they're, they're still alive. I, I mean, I, you deal with your neighbors, friends. This is not a, as much as it is a full-time job, and it is, you're also in the neighborhood. Jesse coaches, Skip does other things. You know so, what? Yeah. You're really wait, scary, wait. baby, because I'm afraid we're going to turn this into a gender issue. <laughs> first, of, first of all, I'd like to state how you're in touch with the people yeah. out there. Yeah. You work in the private sector. And you're not necessarily a ca cashing a government check that's guaranteed every month, you know. It's pretty hard to get fired when you work for the government. You pretty well have to commit a felony to do that, and then maybe you still don't do it. I'm the only candidate that spent his entire career literally working in the private sector. Even while I was mayor, I was required to hold a full-time job in the private sector. My two opponents, they've been cashing government checks for well over 20 years. Okay, speaking of... Whoa, 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 whoa. I got I got yeah, to jump in. I got, you're the, you're the, you know, this thing about cashing, God, I've been a prosecutor. I put people in prison. You know, we need people. Skip, I, you and I may disagree on the vision, but you have served this state well as an attorney general. I mean, we may dis where we go, but, but to talk about that, do you think Rudy Perpich wasn't in touch with people because he was a politician or, or, or Skip Stat? I think that just, it's an absurd proposition. It really is. Pat, it's not fair. You should have asked me what the price of a Dairy Queen was. Uh -huh, I can tell you that. I can tell you a lot of other things. <laughs> okay, and, yeah. uh, Let's go to the Mall of America. <laughs> we have a question from the Mall. Yes, I'm a retired police officer with uh, 35 years of experience in law enforcement and public safety. I strongly believe it's dangerous to have loaded guns in your pockets or pant coat pockets, pant pockets, or your purses walking around in public. If this is your position, why don't we just all have holsters so we can know what we're up against? I would like to ask each candidate this question. Let's start off, Jesse Ventura, let's start with you. Well, for me it's simple. You can set the standard at where you want to set it, but I do not believe that it should be subjective. I believe it should be objective. Not left up to a police chief whether he likes your looks, how you part your hair, or, or things of that nature. I don't agree with that because uh, we also have the right to protect ourselves. You know, if you're assaulted, you cannot sue the police department, you cannot sue the government. And so, therefore, I think that you have the right under the Constitution of the United States of America for your own personal protection. You can set that limit as high as you want to set it, and, and you can make it extremely... Uh, if someone breaks the rules, you can prosecute them beyond belief at that point when you set that standard up there. But if my wife is out, who protects her if she wants to be protected? Is Skip going to be there? I doubt it. I hope the police is going to be there, and I hope that she doesn't need to be protected in the first place, that we have a peaceful place, uh, Jesse, in which to live. But let's, let's understand this. First and foremost, uh, I appreciate the uh, question, and I thank uh, the officer for his many years. I'm honored to be endorsed by uh, the rank and file police in this campaign. I think they know who is, delivers the tool and will work tools and will work with them uh, to see this kind of effort in reducing the violence. But this is where we have a clear distinction between myself and Norman. I do not want to see more loaded, concealed weapons on the street. We do not need to change the laws. The laws work just well and fine and dandy the way they are. If you need to have that loaded, concealed weapon, you can apply for it and you will get that and it'll be just fine. But the reality is it's crazy that to have an individual out there at the mall, how many people would be walking around with a loaded, concealed weapon if we opened this thing up? I think it's wrong. Even Mr. Coleman's uh, police chief says it takes us back to the days of Dodge City. It's wrong. Skip, first two things. One, on this issue, you've demagogued the issue. The Star Tribune said that your commercial on it was misleading. Uh, but beyond, beyond that, we have the law here today. In certain counties, you go to Fergus Falls, and, and if you take NRA training, if you're not a, a felon, if, if you're not a, a drug dealer, so a list of, of prohibited categories, you get, a, you get a permit. The person could be next to you today. By the way, we have it in 31 states, in places like Connecticut and Oregon. And there's no correlation between the people who have a reasonable concern for their safety, the small business guy who may be picking up deposits late at night, who have a concern for their safety, who go through the training, who aren't on that list of prohibited people. There's no correlation between them and any crime. So today what you have, and Jesse's right, you have, you have a system that is not uniform. And we're talking about uniformity. 
We're talking about just as we have uniform criminal laws, we should have the same standard, whether, whether it's Fergus Falls, whether, whether, it's, whether it's Itasca, whatever it is, or, or, or St. Paul, the same standard, and a standard that is fair, that is not subjective. Some places, a chief may say, because you're a woman, I'm not going to allow you to protect yourself or your family. That's absurd. And again, the evidence statistics are very clear. We need to be focusing on those who are criminals. Get the guns out of their hands. You're presuming yeah. that law-abiding people yeah, are, I just, are, are I, I want it. Look, wait, this isn't, a, this isn't about, this minute. is not about uniformity. This is about are you putting more guns on the street, loaded, concealed handguns on the street. And Norman, you can talk all you want. You can say what you want to say, wherever you want to say it. The fact is, we there, don't need more loaded handguns there, that are concealed right now, on the street. There has and never that's been, what you propose. There has never been a licensed concealed carry person who has ever harmed a law enforcement officer, yet there have been 24 cases across the country where a police officer has documented and said his life was saved because there happened to have been a conceal and carry person there that was licensed to carry that weapon. Okay, Let's we're, focus we're gonna, on the criminals and the gang that's members right. and the bad guys. You, we're we're going to right. right. cut it off right here. We're going to move well, on. We have a speed question. Colleen. Aren't these all speed questions? <laughs> <laughs> Gentlemen, this has been debated in people's homes and throughout the country, and there are people coming down on either side. I'm curious what you think. Yes or no, should President Clinton resign? Skip? No. Yes. Let the process go through. I'd say no, and, and let let the, we have a constitutional process okay. that this has to be. Yes no. Okay, it was yes or no. Okay, let's go to Jeff for a regular question. Okay, I want to ask you about the Minnesota lottery. Voters have a chance to decide where some of that money goes uh, this election. What do you think about the Minnesota lottery, and do you think it should be in part used? Because I think a lot of people in the beginning thought this was going to happen. It should be used to help lower taxes in Minnesota. I'll, I'll, I'll jump in. I find it a very unique situation that the government's allowed to gamble. And yet the private sector out there isn't allowed to. You know, the government can have a gambling institution, a thing that feeds them and allows people and, and makes it easy for you to gamble. You can walk into any convenience store, any gas station and do government gambling. But woe be if the private sector were to be allowed to participate in anything like that. I guess we're not capable of it. Again, you've got government being our parents again out there for us. As far as the money end of it goes, it's out there. It exists. Uh, maybe lowering taxes would be a nice way to do it. But but uh, I don't particularly like the idea of people gambling to lower taxes because that's going to fall on uh, the people who fall prey to gambling to begin with, and, and then the taxes get lowered accordingly like that. You know, you, uh, the, the point about the lottery is that it was directed at education and the environment. In fact, we have a, an, a constitutional amendment that is up to renew the commitment to the environment. If those dollars are not there from the lottery, then either we're not going to protect our environment, we're not going to provide the resources in education, or we're going to have to find some other means of where those resources are. I think, in fact, it is reducing those taxes and that tax burden in that sense. So uh, it is that kind of a situation. The people of Minnesota, through their elected representatives, decided that this is what they would uh, allow in terms of uh, public gambling. Frankly, I'm not personally in favor of it, but uh, that's what they decided, and that's where we ought to be uh, making sure that it's honest, that the game is played with integrity, uh, and that it's used for the specific purposes that are designated. The way to cut taxes is to cut spending, uh, to, to uh, do things to generate more economic growth. You don't want to use lottery money to cut taxes. You, it is being used for education, the environment. And by the way, I think we all join in support of Constitutional Amendment Number 1, which is to extend the life of that environmental trust fund. That's important. But you cut taxes when you keep a lid on spending, you generate economic growth. Not, by the way, with the Humphrey Tax and Spend Program, but by well, real putting a lid you, on you know, spending. Let me, I've got to respond. <laughs> you know, Norman, you always say tax and spend and all of that. The fact is, you got more than 26 proposals out there. You haven't, you haven't laid out one iota's worth of a budget that says how you're going to fund those things. And so, you know, you're not being straight with the people. Set your priorities, let them know what those priorities are, and quit promising to every single person. Skip, if you do set the priorities, you say that we're spending one out of every six dollars you spend today goes to state and local governments. It's the difference between Skip and myself. We've got a $23 billion budget. I've made it very clear. 
We're going to figure out ways to live with me, within that, Skip. What you got is you have a spending promise for everyone. No. For everyone. Now, there you from, go from again. Birth. Okay. Birth. I'm sorry, I, I but follow, that... I want to follow up you know, and get back to what we were talking about. Anything, well, I want to get back to what we were talking vote. about because... He knows that's not true. Jesse said that he doesn't want the gamblers to be paying and helping it to lower the taxes. But at the same time, Jesse, I've heard you say before that you would support gambling to help build a new stadium. Well, no, what I, what I would support if, if like, the, say, the Twins need a new stadium, I, I, will, I will not support one dollar of public tax dollars, but maybe they ought to build this stadium with a casino in it to help support it. Let Mr. Humphrey, the, the stadium candidates. situation, I have to get to you because the stadium here is named after your father who said the Twin Cities would be a cold Omaha without professional sports. So we do you have a plan to try and save sports. We got a Vikings team that's going all the way to the Super Bowl. We got a good uh, Minnesota Twins. We've got the Timberwolves. We've got the Wild coming. You have coming. to admit that some of them are on pretty rough ground right now. Do you have a plan to try and save them? I think there's plenty of ways of working with the local business community, with the sports teams, to see that that happens. But we're not going to use tax dollars to build stadiums. That's the same thing that's been going on all around the country. They're trying to put us our backs up against the wall and say, you build it or we're going to leave. Is Roger Moe clear on that? Okay. Okay. Roger because Moe is Roger clear sure on that. Roger wasn't clear Absolutely. on it when he was no. uh, speak you understand. speaker of the state. Hey, he was on board. Norm Skip. Coleman came to the legislature and said, give me $65 million. Give me the tax." He and had Roger a governor went along that said, with and it. Said, and Roger Moe went governor along said, with it. Hey, we're going to do that. <laughs> and Roger went along. No, Roger we said, <laughs> we can't do that. If, if the only way we're going to be able to get this done, if at all, is through a loan. Skip, that's not true. Because you know we, it's because true, Because we went, we, went, we went for a loan, and Roger no, Moe and Sandy... No, you went Roger for Moe a straight and Sandy gift. Mathis rejected okay, hold it. hold on, hold on, hold that's on. That's simply not true. We're going we're to get into a he said, he said thing. The point is, it isn't a he said, he said. The record is clear. This gentleman went for straight straight tax dollars for that okay. for all of his corporate cronies to make it happen and Roger and, Moe and gave an interest free loan and at least got 150 a million okay. dollars I, I, I interest go, free the loan okay, what's, okay. The okay. what's the difference what is the difference I, I do want to uh, between I, straight money and 150 million dollar interest free loan I, I do, I do want to ask a very quick follow up uh, Jesse Ventura said that he would consider a uh, state casino for stadium, okay. I, if that bill reached your desk as governor, veto would you it. veto it, Norm I, Coleman? I, I, would I'd, you? I'd veto it too, but I do think we have an obligation to try to figure okay. out a way to keep. The okay, it's asset. okay for okay. the government to gamble, but it's not okay for private Let's citizens. Let's go it's to the private the government. citizens it's at the, the citizens mall. Of Hi, I'm Carla Brown Dukes. I live in Burnsville. I'm disabled, and I've been very active in school district affairs in our school district. My question is concerning the tax surplus debate that has been going on all this last year. I do not understand why that money has to come back to us instead of being used to replace the cuts that have been made in the education, in the programs for the disabled, in the programs for people who have children who are disabled, the medical programs, the welfare programs. That's my question. And let's go to Norm Coleman first. Skip has uh, said that I'm stealing money from government by giving it back to people. Um, I, I simply disagree. I think that's a crazy supposition. That the way to help people is to, is to give them back their money so that they can then make some, and what you do, let me finish this, what you do then is, is, is you give people greater confidence, you generate greater investment. There are things, there are the safe. Again, we spend $23 billion in government. You keep, we talk about cuts. There, are there many people out there who believe that we need to spend more than $23 billion? We should be able to provide the services, but it's not always about something new. Humphrey comes in, but we need to do, we need to do more, spend more. So I, the fact is what I've proposed is taking that money in the end. You're right, cutting taxes to generate, to give you more economic freedom, give you more opportunity, grow more jobs, and in the end, have government have the ability to do the things it should do. Was I clear that she was talking about the surplus money that, uh, and giving it back? Is that what she was saying? Yes. Well, first of all, she needs to understand that the government sets a budget on the legislative floor. And that's what they say it takes to run the government. Surplus money is above and beyond that. That is not what the government said they were going to do. I am the only candidate that said give the $4 billion back, which would have 
come out to over $1,000 for every man, woman, and child in this state. But yet, they jumped in, the Republicans and Democrats spent it, bonded us to the tune of a billion dollars, laid more debt on us, and increased the growth of government almost 16%. And gave $2 billion back in property tax relief, No, Jesse. $1 billion, Skip. The, but the on the flip is, side, they raised my property the, value. That's a shell game. Don't come across with me on that. The, the, the point is Where's the $2 that billion? you need to not only cut taxes permanently, and that's what I have proposed, billion dollars worth of permanent income tax cuts and those 300 million plus of permanent property tax relief cuts, but then you need to invest. I don't know where Mr. Coleman comes up with this thing that everything is hunky-dory and that we're going to have smaller class sizes, we're going to improve the schools, we're going to help disabled individuals get the kind of education and the opportunities we need and not put forward an investment in education. What you need to do is focus in on what are the few things we're going to do well. The things we're going to do well is return those tax dollars to working families, and we're going to make sure that we invest in our public education system. We're not going to siphon it off to private education. We're not going to put it in stadiums. We're not going to make sure that we're doing all these other crazy things and the billions of dollars, Norman, that you have promised all over this state with no budget whatsoever as to how you do it. You talk that stuff, but you don't put the money there. So we've got to make sure that we are talking straightforward with the public. The reality is, I have set forth a budget that says tax cuts and investment in education and in health care. There must be a ton of pork in the government. Because when you say the word investment to me, somebody's reaching into my wallet spending. in the private sector because okay. you've got to spend it. We, 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 why we, can't we, we, we invest? Whoa, 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 whoa. You really do need, you, do, well, you need Pat, to respond to Pat the Miles, the Pat, no, we're going to move on. Pat Miles has a speed no. question. Well, as long as we're talking about taxes, in recent years, uh, the state legislature gave some local communities uh, the right to raise uh, their taxes on top of the state sales tax. Would you go along with a local government's right to raise their sales tax on top of the state sales tax? Yes or no? Skip? To keep the same, uh, the same laws in place? Yes. No. Local control, yes. Okay, let's have another question, and Pat, you can ask a regular question now. <laughs> <laughs> it's my turn. Well, you know, we, we've been, I think, concerned about the growth of, of our state government, and I, I know that you're concerned as well. And uh, not to point the finger at you, Skip, but when I read the other day that we have 535 employees and we have a $64 million budget in the state attorney general's office here, two -year <laughs> I thought it would be interesting to call some of the other states and compare. Sure. We have a larger uh, budget than Illinois, Wisconsin, Colorado. Would you support perhaps reducing the size of that office or, or the size of other offices in state government oh, sure. so that we have some country. I mean, it seems um, it, amazing to me that Illinois, which has twice our population, has a smaller operating budget. Well, I think it's hard to compare attorneys general's offices from one place to another. Some have, uh, some have the, what we call the BCA. That means the the, the state uh, investigators and all the rest. And there are others uh, that have other agencies. For instance, in Ohio, there are more attorneys public attorneys, state attorneys that the governor controls and actually the attorney general. So it's very difficult to make those comparisons. The bottom, I think the bottom line is where you make this comparison. The fact is that over a biennium, as you say, it's about $64 million. But in each year of the biennium, every year that I've been in, we have saved more than $100 million and returned direct dollars to uh, individuals. Let me, let me give you an example. For instance, just last year, we had the infant formula case. We returned $9 million directly to consumers. We, di we returned uh, direct co to consumers on consumer fraud cases. So the reality is, bottom line, it's a pretty good deal. You know, uh, you're, you're, in other words, that investment is there in terms of those dollars. that investment but, word again. Well, it is an investment. It's the public dollars going into the office of attorney general. And what's the return? A hundred million dollars right. on savings and direct uh, amounts. That's a let, very good deal. Let me just say, deal. Pat, that was a great question because you named all of those lawyers that we have now working in government. And we have two more lawyers here who want to continue working in government. I'm the only person that's not a lawyer running for governor. But let me add something. Mr. Humphrey, why, if you have all those qualified lawyers working in your office, 
Are none of them capable of trying a tobacco case? If we're going to be farming cases out, then let's cut down the size of that attorney general office. You know, it's, it's like a city. If you have an engineering department, if you're going to go out and subcontract out to other engineers all the time, well, then you don't need a big engineering department as being part of government. Over 200 lawyers in that office up there, and none of them were capable of trying that case. But my case. question really is, yeah, have, yes. have the three of you looked at state agencies sure. and, and said, this is where we can cut but, fat? But because I it seems to me we have a lot of fat in state government, uh, let, let especially me, Let me Minnesota. respond, and, and I do have to, have to res respond. The fact is that the Attorney General's budget has grown about three times the rate of inflation of the last biennium. And, Pat, I, you contrast that by what I've done in St. Paul. I mean, I've governed. <laughs> I've, I've cut so the I. size, I've, and I've cut the size of government, so Jess, and I've governed. That's what I've done, and I, I've kept spending under the rate of inflation when I've governed. What about and, and neither And neither of you have done that. Uh, what about so bonding? I have, so I have, and we'll I, I have done, credit card. I have done those things. We merged, let me, but let Norm, me respond. But Norm, what other agencies, you, what other agencies would you cut, what, specifically? Let, let me, with, what you, Pat, let me tell you how you do it, and then I'll give you one or two specifics. But you got, you got to, how do you approach this? One, you do it like we've done in St. Paul. I consolidate, I, I merge health departments, city and county, after 50 years of debate. So you look at, we have three agencies that deal with utilities, look at ways to merge and consolidate. What you do is, is you make a commitment to keep a lid on government spending, and that's something Humphrey hasn't done. We yeah. keep hearing investment. Wait, 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 i got to finish wait, wait. this. It's unfair I'll because, it's unfair because Skip, Skip, is, now running, right? Skip yeah. is now running an agency of the state government, but, so it's unfair for you to attack him oh, on no, that. Just, but what but, I'm saying is what it is agencies a, would you cut if you could be specific it, 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 with it, it, is fair to, it is fair to look at the record. It is fair to look at the record of the mayor of St. Paul who has kept who has cut taxes every year who has kept spending under the rate of inflation who shrunk the size of government except for adding cops we've done that and yet one of the way let me tell you well let me let me throw something out and see whether skip will respond to this one of the ways you cut the size of government and i know jesse will respond i believe the same way is you use notions of competition you see whether something a service can be delivered more cost effectively on the private side. Okay, let's Skip, are you, you know, willing to all, consider I, competition? I love this. Are this you guy worked for me. This guy government? worked for me for ten years. He supported all of what we did. You, when you were on our executive committee, I didn't hear any of these complaints, Norman. I didn't hear any kind of yeah. objections to yeah, what I, we were I, involved with. Hello, yes. Ex excuse me. Can I just ask there you? I just want to know. I just yes. want to know specifically Absolutely. what agencies Major would agency you Major agency that we cut. have got to look at the whole the system Council. of corrections. The Met Council. The whole system of corrections. Skip, are you willing to, Huge are willing to use competition and corrections? We are going to take a look through a performance review council of every single agency. I'm the only candidate that has provided a specific dollar amount by what we're going to cut the budgets, and we are going to look particularly at corrections, and we are going to see, we don't need $80 a day cells. We don't need a Cadillac system. We can provide safety and we can find yep. security in those areas for okay. much less, Skip, and we're going to do it working based on projected with. surplus? It is, but it is. Well, then how do you know? It's, it's not. It's, it's not based, based on upon, any projected it's based surpluses. based upon what Arnie Carlson and his economics people say but is they're there. Projected they're projected surpluses. Yeah, they're projected. Look at the dollar dollar hole in your in no, your budget. Ted Mondale said you got a billion dollar hole. Stop! 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 And whoa! 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 Stop! Don't talk billion dollar holes. How about Ted, five Ted Mondale? Ted Mondale said surpluses. Okay, let's stop it right now. Let's stop it right now. You're spending a million dollars to go to the radical. Right now, you're spending a million dollars to try and get back. Stop! 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 Let's go to the mall of. Thank you for your direct answer. Let's go to the mall of America. I said Met Council. I know. Go. Uh, yeah, my name is John Knight, and I'm from uh, St. Louis Park. And when I went to Morehead State, I saw a lot of students working three jobs and having trouble making it through college. As governor, what will you do specifically to increase access to college for students who come from low-income families? Well, there's already many loan programs and grant programs out there right now. I believe very strongly that if, if you're intelligent and you can survive and, and pass college, you can be intelligent enough to figure out your way to get through there. Nobody says you have to graduate in four years. Nobody says you can't go to the community college first, get your core classes done there much cheaper before you go to the bigger school later. And you can do what I did. When people say there's not a way to do it, you can do military service, which I did, my opponents never did. You then qualify for the GI Bill through your military service, which will help benefit you tremendously to we, getting an education. We have about seven or eight minutes yeah, to go. Another so government let's move on. program, by the way, which seems to work pretty well. And I like that.
I think that's a good program. But the way that you do yeah, it, and I'm the, the only candidate that will help this you young man. You have to put your life on the, the line. You are time. absolutely right. You are absolutely right, Jesse. But the one way that we can help this young man is to make sure that we target a tax cut to help in addition to the HOPE scholarships that are in place to make sure that we don't have an economic barrier for someone to go forward with their first two years. That's exactly what I have proposed. Up to $1,000 per year is going to be very helpful. That will cover almost all of those costs for very low income. Now, let me tell you what the problem is if you don't do that. You bring upon the students some of the highest debt levels possible and then you're trying to ask this individual to go out and make a living for themselves and the rest that's a little bit like what norm coleman has been doing in his city he indebts everybody up to the tune of 900 million dollars okay. that he's spending and debt and and borrowing you very know that's quick, the problem very quickly two things skip thank goodness you're not running saint paul because there'd be no jobs and and, and we go back to when it was run by by a, by the dfl by jim shivlin company the city was dying so we're doing well let me respond to the question and I do have people listening, because Skip's got another program. For every issue that's been raised, he's got a program. And, and as a result of that, that that's going to both spend and spend, and your taxes are going to be raised. I mean, you got you got to listen to that, because in the <laughs> end, it's another program. And it's the way you deal with the question right. raised by, by that young man is, one, first of all, you make sure mom and dad has a job. You do that by cutting tax, by promoting economic growth. That's what I've done. I'm the only one sitting there who's grown jobs. Secondly, what you do is you make sure when the federal government provides Pell Grants, and that program's been expanding, that the state keeps its share. That what we don't do is that we don't take the federal dollars and use the state dollars for more spending. And under Humphrey administration, you're going to see more spending. So make sure mom and dad has a job. Make sure the state doesn't cut the, the Pell Grant opportunities and then do the things you can to keep tuition low. But you do that by promoting economic vitality and sound management, not by more programs. Okay. We're running out of time, it's so I'm going to move program, on. Folks, I just want to make sure what I talked about was a tax cut. Now I'm being okay. attacked for cutting taxes. Okay, it's amazing time, what happens Time for here. a speed oh. question. It's going to come from Colleen and uh, Norm. Skip. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I'm told it's a regular question. Uh, Colleen, take it away. Oh, we're going to do a regular, regular question. question. <laughs> okay. Uh, it strikes me that we've become two very distinct states. Um, the folks who live out state have very uh, specific concerns that those of us who live in a city cannot necessarily always relate to and vice versa. When we're talking about building a stadium here in the Twin Cities, People in uh, Brainerd or Hibbing may not care much about that, but when we talk about whether there ought to be a hunting season on Timberwolves or a moratorium on feedlot expansion, they care very deeply. How do you reconcile the two very distinct needs? Two well, first of all, of first of all, high taxes and government regulation applies across the whole state. Whether you live in southern Minnesota, the Iron Range, or the urban, too much government, too much taxes, too much regulation applies to all of us. But we all have to. You're right. We have to become better acquainted with, with out-state, in-state, and work together. We are one state, the state of Minnesota. And I think one of the things that could accomplish that is unicameral legislation. Because then everything will be debated on the floor. You won't have these conference committees where payback takes place and all of that stuff with, uh, that goes on where, where one person can be a dictator and kill a bill and never allow it to be debated on the floor, which is what you have now. You debate those every bill on the floor, that makes every citizen of Minnesota more educated on the issues and able to understand the issues in different parts of the state. Colleen, I do think that there are some fundamental things that every one of us are concerned about. We're, we're concerned about seeing that taxes are returned to our working families. We're concerned about good public education and the investment that's needed and about health care and about reducing and eliminating that crime. But there are some situations where we need to join together. Every one of us love our lakes and our airs and the clean waters that we have, but we need to join together to figure out how we expand our businesses and at the same time not destroy the very base from which that is drawn. One of perfect examples is up north, the logging industry. They've pulled this together. They're not only logging more forest, but they're growing that forest base. And they're doing that in, with environmentally sound practices as well as good business management practices voluntarily. That's what I think we can do with the livestock industry. That's what I want to see happen. Grow the industry responsibly, not only for ourselves, but for the future. And, and that's probably the greatest challenge, Colleen, for the governor. It's, it's pulling us all together. And in, in, in every coin in your pocket, there's the phrase, e pluribus unum, out of the many one. 
And that's really the mindset you have to have. And Jesse's right. You know, if you talk to any small businessman, whether they're in St. Paul, they're in Southwood, whether they're in Moorhead, they're in Mankato, they're in Worthington, they'll tell you the same thing. Farmers will tell you the same thing. Mayor, they're going to tax us to death. Don't regulate us to death. Make sure that our kids go to world class, have world class education, make sure our streets are safe. And if you do that, we're, we're going to do very, very well. In addition, then, you do look at some of the special opportunities. You, you look at the resources that we have in northern Minnesota, uh, you know, tourism as an example. And we make sure we have policies that promote the natural resources. We don't put bans on, on, on uh, studs on snowmobiles. We should work with the industry to create the technology. So we keep the tourists coming from Wisconsin. We don't do, as Skip has proposed, put moratoriums on livestock. You kill the livestock industry. You kill the grain industry. You kill the food processing industry. So work with the resources. Figure out a way to pull us Thir all 30 together. 30 seconds to go. Last thoughts from both uh, Skip Humphrey and Jesse Ventura. Uh, my last thought is this. You know, a lot of these candidates tell you that your vote is wasted if you vote for Jesse Ventura. That is pompous and arrogant. It's your vote, and I want you to remember that uh, the, the only wasted vote is not voting your conscience or your heart. I just say this, that you need to be able to set priorities. You need to establish them. That's exactly what I've tried to do. I want to see those smaller class sizes. I want to see tax dollars returned to our families that are struggling with children in child care and senior citizens taking care. Those are the things that we need to be able to accomplish. And you need to do that by setting priorities. We have run out of time, gentlemen. I'm sorry. Uh, it's been a fast hour. Thank you all. Uh, Thank you. This was a great Minnesota Debate 98. Uh, our thanks to the folks at KTCA, the best technical crew anywhere, CARE 11 News, Channel 5 Eyewitness News, Minnesota 9 News, and also the Minnesota Broadcasters Association, their work on this project. We thank you. Also, thanks to the folks at the mall and their patience, and thanks for tuning in. November 3rd, get out there.